It's the final week of Travel Month here on Discovering. Tonight we'll take a look at a variety of destinations and activities you might want to try. One of the favorite pastimes here in the Upper Peninsula by youpers and visitors is camping. And with good reason. Stick around, that's all tonight right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover when you're a long-time lover of northern Michigan. The Upper Peninsula makes up 29% of the land mass of the state of Michigan, but only 3% of the population resides here. That means a lot of land with no people. Wilderness, the ideal place for camping. Michigan has more state forest land than any other state in the eastern U.S., most of which is located here in the Upper Peninsula. Along with that, you'll find a number of state parks with a variety of camping opportunities. Do some backcountry camping in the Porcupine Mountains or at the Quaminant State Park. If backcountry is not your style, spend some time in one of their many campsites. If you like a little history mixed in with your camping adventure, check out Fayette Historical State Park. This 711 acre park is located about 17 miles south of US 2 on the Garden Peninsula on Big Beatty Knock between Snail Harbor and Sand Bay. The park offers 61 modern campsites, boat camping, a cottage that sleeps up to 10 people, and about five miles of hiking trails, which are groomed during the winter for cross-country skiing. Fayette was the site of an industrial community that manufactured charcoal pig iron between 1867 and 1891. It was home to nearly 500 residents, many immigrating from Canada, the British Isles, and Northern Europe, following the post-Civil War need for iron. In 1916, the town was purchased by an individual and became a summer resort, and continued in that capacity till 1946. Eventually it was purchased by the Escanaba Paper Company and then swapped with the state of Michigan for timberland. Fayette became a state park in 1959. The town has been reconstructed into a living museum, showing what life was like in this town in the late 19th century. The Visitor Center provides opportunities to learn about life in a 19th century industrial town and visitors can take guided or self-guided tours of the site's 20 historic buildings and scenic overlooks. Fayette was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1970. The museum is open annually from mid-May through mid-October. You'll need a Michigan State Parks Recreation Pass. Admission to the town site is free. Another popular destination is Van Riper State Park. Van Riper Park is about 35 miles west of Marquette, right off US 41, uh, just west of Champion, uh, right on the east shore of Lake Michigami. 90 some miles of shoreline is um, if you have one, a big boat and you like to tool around the lake or even good fishing. Muskie, northern pike, bass, walleye, panfish galore in Lake Michigami. Camping is very similar to what you would consider a state park. We have 147 modern campsites. We have 40 rustic campsites. We have a group campground right on the Pishiki River, gorgeous spot. So if you have friends that want to camp and you don't have your camping gear and you'd like to stay in a little cabin near, right near this, near this campsite, uh, we have a little mini cabin set on a campsite right in the campgrounds. Van Riper is right on the shores of Lake Michigami, has a really nice beach. Um, we also have uh, hiking trails and uh, um, a nice picnic area and uh, cook grills and uh, uh, we have lots of events throughout the summer at that place uh, 
a pavilion, fireworks on, on 4th of July, you, know, you get the bigger boats and they have boat parades, so it's kind of a unique experience on Lake Michigami. <laughs> Grab a canoe and a backpack and head just down the road from Van Riper to one of my favorite spots, Craig Lake. More than 8,400 acres of uninhabited forests, lakes, and rivers. Michigan's most remote state park. Fishing, hiking, beautiful scenery, 8,400 acres of solitude. Craig Lake State Park is the most remote state park in Michigan's system. 8,500 acres of woods and wilderness and uh, most people come out and canoe camp. So you can portage to different lakes, you can do some backpack camping. We also have some cabins and some yurts available. So it's a place just to explore and get away from it all. I and mean, plenty of room to explore. The road coming in is seven miles on a single lane road. A little bit rough. It used to be four wheel drive vehicles only, but now we've improved the road a little bit to where you know most cars can get in here. You just have to be careful. You're long ways from everywhere, and that just kind of gives you that wilderness feel as the road in. It's just, you just know you're in some place special. It's, uh, it's worth the trip. We have uh, two yurts, and a yurt is kind of an elaborate tent. We have a wood stove inside and bunk beds, and um, it has even a skylight in the yurt. It's just kind of a unique experience to stay in a yurt. Not many people have stayed in a yurt before, and I, I think everybody should try it once. Uh, we have two cabins on Craig Lake, and actually they're from Fred Miller of Miller Brewing Company. He had this lodge type cabin where we can sleep 14 people, have a big stone fireplace. He needed somebody to stay up here to take care of his big investment up here, and so he built this caretaker's cabin, a smaller cabin, it's where there's one bedroom, another great room with a wood stove and, and kitchen table and chairs. There is another small little bedroom where it's just got two beds in there. If you have accessibility issues, we will allow you to get back and drive to the cabins, but if you're not, it's about a two mile hike. Uh, most people prefer to carry their gear in a canoe and just launch it right into the lake and paddle that distance so you don't have to carry it on your back. Um, the North Country Trail runs through this park and so we have some campsites along the, that North Country Trail. We partner with that group and they help us clear the trails for us. So it's, it's really kind of a strong trail system. So if you're looking for through maybe going from Craig Lake to McCormick Wilderness area, um, we have some campsites along the way, and then you could experience the McCormick Wilderness area, which is just a short distance away, and lots of places to explore. We have lots of campsites here at Craig Lake Park, although it's not your typical state park campground. It's uh, more of a backcountry experience. We have some campsites at the point here at Craig Lake where people can carry a short distance, they're one-fifth of a mile, carry their gear in, but those people that kind of want to really get away from it all, they can portage to different lakes or there's campsites all around the lake and you'll see a little fire ring. Sometimes we have a picnic table, sometimes we don't. It's just kind of a wilderness camping experience. Lots of lakes at Craig Lake Park to explore and they each offer something a little different. Teddy Lake, where we have a, a yurt, that's panfish. Craig Lake, is, it has a, lots of different species of fish. We have the muskie, northern pike, bass, crappie, lots of nice crappie. Walleye, you can keep walleye. Flair Lake, um, it's a similar to Craig Lake in fishery, yet it's a little bit more difficult. It's like a half, three-quarter mile carry with your canoe. It's kind of like an untouched fishery. Similar species to what we have on Craig Lakes, yet not many people make it up there, so that'd be a fantastic fishery. Uh, moving over to Crooked Lake, uh, bass, a uh, small and largemouth bass. You're really quite successful with fishing there. Kuwaitan Lake, walleye, panfish. If you're looking for a day experience hike, uh, I would suggest walking around the Craig Lake. It's about three and a half hours during bug season. <laughs> it's four, four and a half hours during uh, most of the summer. The trail is pretty rugged. We built a new suspension bridge across the Pashiki River. So this, it's really pretty unique, worth the walk just to go look at this bridge. You get to see this really cool suspension bridge over a river in the middle of nowhere that they actually had a helicopter flying concrete back and forth from a staging area away from the park. It, you can't even tell there's concrete out there and it's just, the bridge looks great. 
this is a really special place at night. Uh, it is so quiet, no lights. You can't hear the road. All you can hear are the birds singing and the loons calling at night. I mean, we're so far away from the roads, you don't hear another sound except for what is happening normally. Whether you're pitching a tent, pulling a camper, driving a motorhome, or paddling a canoe, there's a campsite somewhere in the UP with your name on it. We're lucky here in the UP and the fact that we never really have to travel far to find remoteness and seclusion. It's never really any further than a few minutes away by car, or in this case, by boat. Located a half mile offshore from Munising is 13,500 acres of Lake Superior woodland known as Grand Island. It's a great place for hiking, mountain biking, camping, hunting, fishing, or just to get away for a day. In 1990, Grand Island was elevated to the status of National Recreation Area by Congress after the U.S. Forest Service purchased the island from its former owner, Cleveland Cliffs Iron Company. The scenery on the island is beautiful. There is quite a range of scenery from forest, deep forest trails to lots of shoreline areas, including some beautiful beaches where we have campsites, day use areas. Some folks like to come to the island to enjoy it. Uh, from the water with their um, personal boats or kayaks, sea kayaks, or even uh, pontoons. There's even a rental for pontoons in town nearby and folks rent and come over and enjoy the day. So the island is uh, about 13,500 acres. It's a rather large. It stretches about eight miles from its bottom end to its north end and about four miles wide. So it's, it's quite a long uh, island and it takes a while to get from one end to the other, but we do have trails that run around the entire rim of the main island. That loop is about 25, 26 miles. Day hiking on the island is certainly a, a great way to spend maybe half a day planning four to six hours, depending on what your goals are. Um, but there's a nice loop that you can take around the southern end of the island walking from the landing where, where you will land on the ferry. You can walk up to some historic buildings where uh, we have interpretive exhibits. People can learn about the, the sites. You could walk on to Murray Bay Beach and maybe up to Trout Bay Beach. Um, and then uh, if you're hiking, uh, you can hike straight back, retracing your steps uh, back to the landing. So that's a nice little loop. So we have some hiking only trails on the island, but we also have a good number of dual use trails that are for hiking and mountain biking. Um, some of those routes travel over uh, roads as well, so they're actually gravel. Uh, we do recommend that you bring a mountain bike. Touring bike's really not appropriate here based on the uh, surface. There's a variety of options to look at. You can plan a fairly simple route that stays on the gravel roads, or you can get a little more adventurous and take uh, the dual use trails and those tend to um, there be a native surface uh, some of them are fairly smooth and flat but then as you get onto the north end of the island they get a little bit rougher and bumpier there are a range of camping options on Grand Island first of all we have several campsites that are for small groups another option is group campsites we have uh, several groups of campsites on the island for folks kayaking we have a couple of campsites that were designed specifically for water access. And then lastly, we actually have a rental cabin on the island that um, can also be reserved. So that's another nice option. Um, there are no concession stands or stores on the island at this time. The ferry service runs about from Memorial Day through early October. The ferry service uh, is located at the landing on the mainland side. So you just buy your ticket there. You can even rent a bike there at the landing. Bring the family over. It's, it's really nice to have that shuttle service to be able to go back and forth and not have to use your own boat. If you enjoy the great outdoors, but don't have a camper or a tent is not your style, you're not quite out of luck. 
Check out any of the many cabins, resorts, and lodges for an overnighter or a weekend vacation. Wherever you end up, you're usually not far from water. Grab a rod and spend some time in a boat. And when you're done, it doesn't get much better than cooking what you caught. Camping comes in many forms. I seem to prefer to camp in spots that are only accessible by canoe or kayak. Just something about that disconnection from roads and vehicles that makes it so much more special. In the western UP, you'll find 18,327 acres of primitive land that is part of the National Wilderness Preservation System, featuring endless canoeing, fishing, hiking, and wildlife viewing opportunities. Situated just west of the town of Waters Meet, you'll find 30 square miles of rugged beauty known as the Sylvania Wilderness. Within its borders lie 34 named lakes set against the backdrop of old growth forests. It represents one of only a handful of such areas left in the Midwest and the perfect UP location for those who seek the solitude of a wilderness experience. Sylvania has been designated wilderness area since 1986. Prior to that, it was ran mainly as semi-permitive area. Primarily it's non-motorized uh, hiking and canoeing water access campsites. Very beautiful area, pristine, it's virgin timber. The area has never been logged for the most part. Um, you can get out and walk around and see a long ways through the woods because there's not a lot of underbrush. Well, with the perimeter area in the wilderness area, 25 to 30,000 acres, and it has 33 named lakes, most of them very deep, crystal clear lakes. The fishing is fabulous out here on these lakes, mostly because it's protected by regulations from the Michigan DNR in conjunction with the Forest Service. And not only the fishing regulations, but also the, the wilderness rules and regulations that are used to manage a wilderness area. Things such as no portage wheels allowed, uh, no motorized equipment. Sylvania goes a little bit further, uh, no, no pack or saddle stock animals are allowed. So it's a very special area. Uh, we take our task of managing Sylvania wilderness area very seriously and um, it gets a fair amount of use and it takes uh, the presence of, of rangers and DNR uh, law enforcement people to make sure that it's safe for the future generations of Sylvania. Sylvania has about 35 miles of hiking trails and portage trails. Um, it's, it's really a nice area to hike. Uh, those, those 35 miles are trails that are maintained by the Forest Service. As trees fall across them, we go out and clear them, but we have to clear them with non-mechanical equipment, so we use crossfit saws and axes. And a lot of these trees are very large, so you can imagine it takes a lot of time. In addition to that, a lot of the lakes in Sylvania have game trails, the animals, deer and things like that use, so you can pretty much hike around a lot of the lakes because they have a game trail. They're not maintained by the Forest Service, but you can, you can follow them. And uh, one other thing to keep in mind, uh, the trails in Sylvania are only cleared to the standard wilderness width of two feet. So they're only cleared to, to a, a tread width of two, two feet wide. Yeah, the special fishing regulations, uh, it was recognized early on that Sylvania was very special in, in its fisheries. Because of the nature of the lakes, they're mostly glacier formed lakes and they're deep and cold water and the fish don't reproduce as readily in these lakes as, as they would in other lakes mainly because of the nutrient waters are not readily available of, of flowing in and out and so they're slow growing fish the populations of fish are not as high as some other areas 
and therefore the special regulations to preserve what we have uh, with the, the trophy bass fisheries where you, the rules are you cannot keep any bass regardless of size. You cannot use any live, dead, or preserved baits. That includes like your, your power scented baits. Uh, and then other fish have size restrictions. You can only keep one a day. And it's, it's all there to protect the fisheries. It's kind of like what the first uh, people to visit Sylvania would have found the fisheries to be like. It's pretty much the same as it's always been. Another reason for the um, slow growth of the, of the fish in the Sylvania waters are due to the fact that the Lake Superior Mississippi Continental Divide runs through Sylvania. So uh, along, along between Clark Lake and Loon Lake, uh, any waters uh, coming out of Sylvania flow to the south to the Mississippi River. Anything to the north flows to Lake Superior. So it has a watershed uh, going north and south and really no, no waters to speak of coming in to feed the lakes, which is why they're so dependent on, on the amount of snow we get in the winter and the amount of rain we get in the summer. So the lake levels, uh, they go up and down with, with what type of weather we get on any given year. If you're thinking about a trip to the Sylvania wilderness, but don't have a canoe, kayak, or any of the necessary equipment, not to worry. About a mile west of Waters Meet, you'll find Sylvania Outfitters. Not only can you rent everything you need, but they are a great base of operation and source of information for your adventure into the North Woods. Over the last four shows, we've looked at just a small sample of the many amazing places found across the Upper Peninsula. So many unique and special places, all within far less than a day's travel. Spend some time this year discovering this wonderful place where we live. Go camping. Stay in a cabin. Visit a museum. Learn about a lighthouse. Check out a waterfall. Go for a week, a weekend, or an afternoon drive. Doesn't matter, just go. Whatever you're looking for, there's a pretty good chance you'll find it right here in your own backyard. Well, that's it for this week. Be sure to check out 906outdoors.com where you'll find the 906 fishing report, TV6 weather, shopping, and more. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.